Jesus better than the other guys. Because there is no competition, Jesus Christ is so vastly superior to all other, quote, religious leaders in the history of man. And today, we need to talk about that and see why is Jesus better than all the other leaders in the world. You can take your Bible and would you meet me in Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews in chapter 9. One time a preacher preached and he preached a great message about the blood sacrifice of Jesus. He started in the Old Testament, worked his way to the New, and really did a good job showing salvation by faith alone in Christ alone because of the blood sacrifice Jesus Christ made. After the message, he stood by the door and they filed out one by one in a very well-dressed, sort of uppity young career woman came by him, lightly took his hand, looked him in the eyes and said to him, I think I enjoyed your message, but I really wished that you wouldn't talk about the blood so much. The more you talk about the blood, I just feel like those of us who are ladies and gentlemen are becoming more and more offended with you. The man never skipped a beat. He looked kindly right back into her eyes and said, Ma'am, Jesus didn't die for ladies and gentlemen. He died for sinners. Hebrews in chapter 9, the writer of Hebrews is on his theme of better, better, the key word of this great book would be the word better, and he's showing in uh, various ways how that Jesus Christ is better at every level than anything they've ever known, any revelation of God, any messenger that came from God, any sacrifice that was ever made, or any bearer of any sacrifice ever made, Jesus Christ is better. In Hebrews chapter 9, he's really boring in on what Jesus has accomplished in the matter of his blood and what that has to do with remission of sin. Pick it up with me, Hebrews chapter 9. And verse number 21, moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. The key point of verse 22 then in this whole context is the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that, both Old Testament and the New teach, that without that shedding of blood of Jesus Christ, there's no remission of anyone's sin. So do you want me to, to preach about blood, or should I try and treat us as ladies and gentlemen who don't need blood? Look, we are desperate. We have no hope of ever having the sin that is a barrier between us and God be removed by anything other than that blood of that Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Anybody want to say amen to that? That right there, ladies and gentlemen, is a mouthful. But it also separates, separates the true message of the Bible from all counterfeit messages. And you know that across the land today and across the globe, there is a kind of salvation being taught that doesn't include blood. And that, my friend, is no true salvation at all. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Now, there's something here that might trouble a little, and I want to I look at this together. Verse 22, the first line, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Does it trouble you a little that it says, Almost all things? Well, the key here to understand is this little phrase, by the law. Hebrews is a Hebrew book. Hello? Hebrews is a Hebrew book. Hebrews delves down into the law because the problem that this writer is dealing with is that people 
are, uh, they're stuck in reverse. They have shifted into reverse in their walk with God. In their faith life, they have looked backwards at the law and somehow the law has an adorning to them that, th- that they can't resist. And, and they're going backwards. Rather than look at the finished work of Christ, the blood that was bled, the sacrifice that was offered, the priest that offered the sacrifice, they're sort of looking back to Moses and the sacrificial system of blood and their human-made tabernacle. And so the writer of Hebrews is taking this on to say, wait, 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 you're going backwards and you're wearing yourself out. Your head is hanging down, your knees are weak, and you are slated for the negative discipline of God. And the writer here gives several examples of people who have come against the, the revealed truth of God and how that God had to deal with them. And he said, look, if God has done that in the past, he is surely going to deal with you. You have a fiery judgment waiting for you because you've known the blood, you've known the truth, you've tasted the good grace of God that saves. Is that good? But now you are going backwards back into the law. Do you realize this is a problem today? This is a problem today. People, some people are going backwards into the law as though there is some special crown in that there's not a crown there's no crown in the law no crown in the law ladies and gentlemen if you're ever tempted to try and live under the law thinking that will make you a better believer in Jesus you'll be disappointed in the end because the law brings us to disappointment The law will never bring us to salvation. Let me say it in a very plain way. The law will never make a bad man good, and it will never make a good man better. If that were true, then God would have made the law the cherry on top of the whipped cream on top of the peach cobbler. hmm? But the cherry belongs to Jesus. And salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ alone because the revelation of the truth of the gospel is all about the remission of sin by the blood shedding of Jesus Christ. And we're called to faith in him and not what the law could do. But there, there is a fad, there's a fad happening in the world across the church that people are, 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 are seeing some kind of reward in living under that Old Testament inferior revelation of the law. We need to call our attention to the fact that the writer of Hebrews said, better, better, better is Jesus, better is faith, better is the redemption that's offered through the shedding of the blood than there was ever anything found under the system of Moses' law. So let's bore down on this thing that might unsettle you a little, this word almost in verse 22. Well, the key to understanding this is that the writer of Hebrews is not delivering this message in any other context than The law of Moses and those days of animal sacrifices being made in the tabernacle. Now hold a finger here in Hebrews. We'll be back, but join me in Leviticus chapter 5. Let's have a taste of Moses' ministry under the law. This ministry in this period of time as God works with men that is so dim, so dim when compared to the greater, the superior, the better revelation of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Leviticus and chapter 5, here's the answer to this this question of almost. What what do we mean almost all things are purged? Leviticus chapter 5, verse number 9, here we go. And he shall sprinkle of the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar. And the rest of the blood shall be wrung out at the bottom of the altar. It is a sin offering. So here's this Old Testament picture. An animal has died. A priest is on the job. He's taking the animal's carcass and he's taking the animal's blood and doing as he's been told to do under Moses. Now, we won't go into all this, but just so you know, all these offerings 
are full, are, are absolutely chock full of types. These are typologies. These are symbols. These are all little chalkboard illustrations of what Jesus will do one day, okay? And it's so important that we never let a chalkboard stick man that only represents something else ever become the real thing, amen? Well, this is the stick man illustration on the chalkboard. He's teaching of something that will come that will be better than anything that illustrated the realness, huh? So there's verse 9, verse 10 now. And he shall offer the second for a burnt offering according to the manner. And the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin which he hath sinned, and it shall be forgiven him." So this is all how to take an animal, give him to the priest, and let the priest do what he's been instructed to do by Moses and Aaron, who got it from God, how to do the offering of this sacrifice. But now look at verse 11, very interesting. But if he be not able, key phrase, if he be not able... Now, let me ask you, if we called for a sacrifice this morning, how many of you would be able to quickly go into your flocks and your herds and bring the proper bull, goat, or lamb as prescribed by the law of Moses? How many of you would be able to go into your flocks and, and lead in the goat sacrifice? Oh, well, then you were in the mind of God when he wrote Leviticus 5 and chapter 11. If he be not able. You see, not all of them who were in that camp of Hebrews had the sacrifice to spare. They didn't have the bull to give up. And if he be not able to bring two turtle doves... Let's just ask here, how many of you would be able to go to the home farm and bring in your two turtle doves this morning for the sacrament? Oh, so you, you would be, my hand's up too, fresh out of turtle doves at our house. But if he be not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that hath that sinned shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour. Now, how many of you would be able, if we were making an offering today, that if you had the option that you could bring in a cup of flour instead, you'd be able to meet the offering? Really, let's see these hands. Uh, Almost everyone in the building. So this is a substitute for the substitute. If you didn't have the blooded animal, you can bring in some fine flour. This is God's economic provision for those unable to make an offering of an animal. Hmm? Is that good? Is that good? Verse 12, then shall he bring it to the priest. And the priest shall take his handful of it. Can you picture that? You picture a priest dipping into a bowl of fine flour and takes a handful of it. Shall take his handful of it, even a memorial thereof, and burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. It is a sin offering. So there were Old Testament offerings and there were priestly things accomplished without an animal that still stood for a blood sacrifice. Is that good? Is that good? So this is what the writer of Hebrews is referring to, that there were examples under Moses' ministry that a sacrifice was made that only stood in for the lack of a blood animal. But make no mistake, friend, there is no other alternative to Jesus Christ in our day. Hmm? Verse 23, it was uh, back to Hebrews chapter 9, now verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens, now let's stop right there and put this together. What does it mean, the patterns of the things in the heavens? 
what is that? It's Moses' tabernacle. Moses' tabernacle is the pattern of the thing in the heavens. What is the thing in the heavens? God's tabernacle. Moses' tabernacle was built by man with God's blueprints. But God has a real tabernacle in heaven that wasn't built by man. That's built by God. Is that good? Is that good? So he says in verse 23, it was, it was necessary then that the patterns of things in the heaven. You really ought to write Moses' tabernacle beside that so it'll be there when you read it again. Because this is one of those places in the Bible. You have to really slow it down. You have to really do slow Bible study. You won't be able to follow the teaching in verse 23. The patterns means Moses' tabernacle. Of things in the heavens, that means God's temple in heaven should be purified with these what is these animal blood sacrifices but the heavenly things what is that that's God's temple in the heavens themselves with better sacrifices than these so which is better Moses' tabernacle under law or God's tabernacle under the blood offering of Jesus Christ and salvation by faith in it. Hmm? So this is the whole argument for all 13 chapters of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus has a better system of salvation than anything ever offered under the law. And I say amen to that. Even the tabernacles are compared. Hmm? The one on the earth, we can't even find it now. And the temple of God in heaven that is holy and forever. That's the better sacrifice. Now, would you leave Hebrews chapter 9 and go back to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. Here's Jesus during his earthly ministry on earth. Matthew 26. One verse here, verse number 28. In describing the Lord's Supper in the first Lord's Supper ever. The one that would be a model that we still follow today. Jesus made this statement in the middle of it. Verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament. Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This, let's break this down. This is my blood. There is no other. He is the Lamb of God. He is going to be arrested this very night. He will be killed tomorrow, though no man takes my life from me, but I give it away myself. Please understand this. Jesus Christ at the cross was not a victim. He was a willing sacrifice, not a victim. He calls it the New Testament. This is the new thing with God. This is the better thing from God. The offering of the body of God as the sacrificial substitute payment for our blood offering that will pay our sin forever. Is that good? Is that good? So he calls it the New Testament offering. He says, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. For many here is language that describes the fact that you as a man might bring your bull. You might even be required as a man to bring the bull that will cover the sins, atone for the sins of your family. But Jesus Christ brought the sacrifice as the high priest of God who brought the sacrifice of himself and he did that for not himself. And he didn't do that for his family. He did that for many. Because his is the only sacrifice that was worthy enough, that was good enough, that was valid enough, that he could offer that for others, many others. Here, in fact, is one of those places I described this in another message. You can find it. I won't go into the detail of it now. But many can mean all. Hmm? Many can mean all. Simply because to say many might mean everything there is. 
if everything there is would constitute there being many of them. And so Jesus Christ here makes a blood offering. It's a New Testament from God with the world. And it's an offering that doesn't cover Jesus or his family, covers many, which is all people, in fact, we know. 1 John 2, 2 says, he is the propitiation and not for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2. Two, two. I emphasize that to, to tell you, please stand, please stand against the idea that's becoming more popular, it seemed by the day, that Jesus paid a limited atonement, that he only died for people who ultimately are going to be in heaven. That's just not true. Jesus died for all. He paid for the sins of the whole world. Not only for the ones who are saved. People will never be in hell saying, well, I'm in hell today because he didn't pay for mine. No one will ever make that claim in hell. He paid it all. Is that good? Is that good? Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans in chapter 3 now. Paul the Apostle is all over this. It's called justification by faith. It's all about the offering that Jesus Christ made, not one that we could make under anybody's law. Romans chapter 3, now pick it up in verse 24. He says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And so here is justification by faith. Look up at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law, without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, by faith of Jesus Christ, by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, unto all. This faith, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is unto all. Now, if Jesus didn't die for everybody, then he couldn't write it that way, could he? This righteousness of God is available today. It's unto all. It just so happens that all uh, is many people whom Jesus Christ died for at the cross. So does that mean that all have this, this righteous, are all saved because Jesus died for all? No, look carefully at the way he says it here. The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. So he died for all, but all are not saved. Only those who believe in what's available to them carry the benefit for that which he died. For all have sinned, verse 23, and come short of the glory of God. So what we had fallen short in, Jesus Christ fills the gap. Hmm? We needed a blood-bearing sacrifice that was holy in himself. Let's make this point. Friend, we are not saved by the life that Jesus lived. We are saved through the death that he died the payment for our sin is not the life of Jesus Christ, our leader. We live because of the death he died that was a sin offering, blood payment, never to be repeated again because it pulled out sin by the roots. It's a little like me when I had my wisdom teeth episode. I said, Doc, it's going to kill me. Let's do it one time. So he referred me to the specialist who would take all my wisdom teeth out with one go at it. I'm pretty certain. 
They put me under the gas, but apparently they didn't give me enough of it to go through what I was going through. I think they gave me the dose that you're supposed to have in another situation, but it was a little different in my case. So I woke up in the middle of it all, and I'm pretty certain You'll never be able to talk me out of the idea, I'm so certain of this, that he was jacking on my jaw with a tire tool. Pretty sure that's what it was. I woke up at home with big craters that many in my mouth. But I'll tell you one thing, I've never had to deal with a wisdom tooth again. Do you see a connection here? Jesus Christ jacked our sin out with a tire tool. He did it once. It'll never be repeated. We're not waiting for some second offering to ever be made. We're not trying hard to, to help him to save us. We're not trying to figure out what we can do that will add to what he did. And through the course of the church, the church has had many adversaries in church history to the true gospel of Christ. Man is absolutely bent on shouldering some of his own responsibility to get rid of his own sin. And we work so hard at this. We work so hard to our absolute shame to build a system of salvation that involves a lot of hoop jumping. In fact, today, this very hour, all over the world, unsaved people will be confronted with something savable, a system that if they do it all would save them that will involve these kinds of things. Well, you need to be sorry for your sin. You need to be sorry enough that God would recognize your sorrow for your sin. You'll need to get out of your seat and come forward. You'll need to talk to a counselor. You'll need to say a prayer. You'll need to confess your sins. You'll need to turn from your sins. And you'll need to do this publicly in front of other people. And if you jump through all those hoops successfully and really mean it and show it with a changed life from now until you die, then you'll be saved. Is, is, that, is that what it is? We would really struggle to outline that system of salvation using the Scriptures, wouldn't we? Why, why have we come to this system? Because man is absolutely bent at erasing the work of Jesus Christ and giving him the glory to say, without your blood offering for me, I am rightly toast in hell. We are so slow to put ourselves under the utter condemnation that the law brings us that we say, oh, I just want to cling to law a little bit and help God out. But we can't help him, can we? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And where the blood of Jesus Christ has taken on sin, it blotted it completely out, pulled it out by the roots, removed it, took it away, and blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Amen. Amen. Back to Hebrews chapter 9 now, Hebrews chapter 9. So Jesus made that blood offering, died and paid it all. And rose from the dead to prove it. Now what I'm telling you this morning is, this is what separates Jesus Christ from all religious leaders in the history of earth. No one else has ever taken away a single sin of another human being. No one could ever make that offering. No one ever, ever claimed to. There's no claim. There's no claim of a sin-bearing Redeemer who gave his body and blood to pay for others. That's what separates Jesus. That's why he is vastly superior and ultimately God the Savior of believers in him. And now here's the second thing. I want you to know this. Jesus' life does not save us. It's not how holy he was. 
It's not even that he was God that saves us. It's the fact that he is eternal God who took on human flesh, came and bore our sin in his body and died to make a body and blood offering to pay our sins before the eyes of God the Father. Hmm? That's what saves us. It's not his life, it's not how good he was, not what he accomplished, not how holy he was. Not even the fact that he was God is saving for us, but it's in his offering for our sin that lies our salvation if we rest our faith in him. Hmm? His resurrection is the after proof of it. His life makes him worthy to offer his body and blood for a sacrifice. You see, if he had ever sinned, then that means he's not God. If he had ever sinned, he would be paying his blood and body for his own sin, but he didn't have any. He transferred, this is the double substitution. He took our sin, bore it in his body. When we believe in him, he takes his righteousness and puts that to our account. Is that good? It's a double substitution. But it's not his good life he lived that saved us. It's his good death that he died that provides our salvation. His resur- that makes him worthy. His good life makes him worthy to offer his body in a blood sacrifice. It's the resurrection that is the after proof that the payment he made was accepted in heaven. The resurrection is the proof of that. If he hadn't come out of the grave alive, then how, in, how could we ever rest our faith in him as the one who took our sin away? But he'd fulfill the prophecy of his resurrection, and that gives us the after proof that we put our faith in the right one. Amen. Back to Hebrews chapter 9 now. Hebrews in chapter 9, and let's finish this great verse. Jesus Christ then after paying this penalty, still had work to do, and he did it. Hebrews, in verse 9, chapter 9, and verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. All right, here's your Bible study. In the margin, would you write Moses' earthly tabernacle? Jesus Christ did not consult with Moses. Jesus did not ask Moses to make his sacrifice for him. No, no, because we have a different priesthood involved here. Jesus is not of Moses' priesthood. He has another priesthood to offer a better sacrifice by a higher priest. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. That's Moses' figures on earth that are figures of the true tabernacle in heaven. And Jesus did not enter into that tabernacle made with hands, which is only the figure, the pattern, the symbol, but into heaven itself. <laughs> Now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Jesus Christ went into God's holy temple in heaven. A man has never touched it. And Jesus entered into that temple and and flicked his blood on the altar outside the veil and entered into the veil and applied his blood on the mercy seat to stand between God and sinners who now have a mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. That good? Where is he now? There, there, guarding, guarding the righteousness that is ours by the blood sacrifice of himself. He's on the job. He's on the job today guarding our redemption, our justification, our righteousness with God. That's what he's doing. And he told us to never ever forget. And he gave us a way to remember that's what the Lord's Supper is all about. It's not a sacrifice. Do you know there are priests who will hold that little cracker because you can't touch it, they say. Only the priests can. Do you know they say 
this is the body of Jesus and they pretend that he's making a sacrifice of the body of Jesus. That sacrifice already, already was made, amen? That sacrifice was made, that blood was dripped and that Savior is risen from the dead and ascended back into heaven who guards his blood sacrifice today. Look with me, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number nine. He says, then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. What is the first? It's Moses' system. What's the second? Jesus' way. Verse 10, by the which will we're sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Look at it. Once for all. All. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can what? Never take away sin. You will never get your salvation offering from any priest of man. Look at verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So friend, I know that my salvation is sealed. My salvation is complete I am not being saved based on what I'm doing in my life that God will add to what Jesus did for me when he, no, 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 a thousand no's. I am not adding to anything Jesus did. He was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That good news for you, is your salvation sealed? Is it secure? Is it forever? If not, friend, you need to trust in Christ and do so right now. Right now, even as I say the words, Put your faith in Christ. I'm afraid to be saved. Don't I have to walk forward? No one in the Bible did. Why should you? Where do we get that from? We made it up. Well, don't I have to say the sinner's prayer? No preacher in the Bible ever led anybody in, in the sinner's prayer. Well, where do, where do we get it? We made it up. And the Bible said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. God must have really wanted people to be saved because he made it a very simple transaction. You put your faith in what my son has done for you, and I'll give you his righteousness and everlasting life as a gift.